Most games will be primarily made up of physics bodies and area nodes, all of which I've made videos on explaining how to use them and what they do. But in order to really get the most out of them, I think it's important to go one level lower, to the collision object class itself, which is the base class for whom all the nodes mentioned inherit, and is where all the code responsible for handling collision layer interactions, collision shapes, and certain inputs comes from. So. Let's dive in, starting with layers and mass, which are controlled by the aptly named integer variables, collision layer and collision mask, with the former controlling what layer the node in question is on and the latter determining what layers it scans for collisions. To better illustrate the way this works, let's say you fling two rigid bodies set to be on layer 1, but with mass set to layer 3 at each other. When they should come into contact, they'll instead just slip right through each other. Now, if we repeated that, but changed it so at least one of them has a mask set to 1, they will instead both register the collision like you would expect. Also, another thing about layers I think is important, but from what I can tell is often not covered, is the misleading nature of the actual collision layer and collision mask values. As stated, they are integers, and your intuition is probably that if you set a node's layer to 4, said node's collision layer variable will also equal 4. But that's not the case. Instead, it equals 8. This is because each layer and mask, though from here forward I'm just going to refer to layers for the sake of brevity as everything coming up applies to both, is effectively composed of three values. The in editor layer number, which is only used in the editor to better convey to the user what layer is being set, their bit value, which is equal to their editor value minus 1, and their true at runtime value, which is equal to 2 raised to the power of their bit value. An additional thing to bear in mind with these variables is that when you have multiple layers active at once, they will equal the sum of all those layers' true values. For example, a collision object on layers 4 and 5 will have a collision layer variable equal to 24. With that in mind, there are two sets of functions that help streamline the process of reading and manipulating layers at runtime those being get collision layer bit and get collision mask bit, both taking an integer representing the bit of the layer you want to check and returning a bool based on if the layer is active or not, and set collision layer bit and set collision mask bit, which also take an integer as their first argument with a bool as their second, toggling the corresponding layer based on said bool. After that, we have the collision object's semi-unique input handling, which is controlled by the bool variables input pickable for 2D and input ray pickable for 3D. When these are true, they allow the subject to detect when the mouse or touchscreen input is inside their collision bounds, and if so, process the related input events. Said input detection is primarily done through the collision object's unique signals, mouse entered, mouse exited, and input event. The first two of them are extremely straightforward, just emitting when the mouse cursor has either entered or exited the collision bounds of the subject. The third signal though is a bit more interesting, emitting every time a mouse or touch related input occurs while inside the subject, with some differences depending on if said subject is 2D or 3D. With the 2D version only carrying three arguments, the first being the viewport containing the subject, the second being the input itself which will always be either a mouse button, mouse motion, screen touch, or screen drag input event, and the final argument is the collision shape index of the shape the mouse is inside of. The 3D version on the other hand returns a bit more and slightly different information, starting with its first argument, which rather than the viewport is the camera through which the subject is being rendered. Following that, the second argument is still the trigger event, but the third argument is completely new being the position in 3D world space of the cursor on the subject surface, and the fourth argument is likewise the normal of the subject surface at that point. And the final argument is the collision shape index, just like the 2D version. In addition, there's an automatic function called underscore input underscore event. Notice how it has nearly the exact same name as the previously mentioned signals, with the only difference being the additional underscore at its beginning. Well, that's because it's functionally identical to said signals. Being an automatic function that runs under the same conditions said signals would emit and takes the same arguments. This is pretty much here just to save you the hassle of manually connecting the node's signal to itself every time you want to take advantage of the signal's functionality. Also, be aware that other collision objects can, even if they are transparent, block the object from detecting the mouse. Alright, with that we can move on to the most confusing part of collision objects, and the part that took me the longest to figure out how to cover. The way collision objects actually handle their collision shapes. Which probably sounds a little strange to most of you, as your first thought will likely be that their shapes are defined by the separate collision shape node. 
but in actuality the collision shapes of a collision object are held within and managed by the object itself in the form of shape owners. These can be thought of as pseudo objects which contain the actual shape or shapes as they can have multiple, an owner node, think of it as the node the shape is attached to, and a variety of other settings that control the shape's location if it's enabled and so on. Collision objects have 19 functions related to shape owners that allow you to make and manipulate them in any way you want. The thing is though, there's not a real reason to use the majority of them, and using them can add a good bit of unneeded complexity to your project. That's because, despite the docs saying collision shape nodes are an editor-only helper meant to facilitate the creation of shape owners, implying that, at runtime, they would be functionally identical to the node class they inherit from, they actually have the majority of these functions' functionality built in automatically modifying the corresponding attribute of their shape owner every time you change one of their own variables. Due to that, they are generally easier to use while also often resulting in more readable code. Here, I'll put some examples on the screen. See how you don't have to keep up with indexes and all the lines are comparable if not shorter in length? Even procedurally producing collision shapes, the main use case these functions get brought up in, is still just about as easy when using collision shape nodes especially if you're using one that's already part of the scene. And to cap it all off, only shape owners automatically generated by collision shape nodes will be visible when you have the visible collision shapes debug option turned on. So with all that in mind and for the sake of not quadrupling the length of this video for a series of functions I feel you generally shouldn't use, I'll just zero in on the only one that sees common use shape find owner, which takes an integer corresponding to the shapes index and returns its owner node. The reason this function is so useful is due to it being able to be used with most collision and input related functions and signals, such as the previously covered input event signal to determine which specific collision shape is responsible for triggering said signal or function. This allows you to do things like making different hitboxes take different damage. And finally, after all that, we can get back on track with the only thing left to touch on, the function getRID, which, true to its name, returns the object's RID, short for resource ID. This simple integer is an opaque piece of data that doesn't do anything on its own, but can be used by the lower level server classes, such as the visual and physics server for an array of advanced operations. And there we are, all the things you need to know about collision objects and how to use them. But there is one thing I would like to quickly go over, as it isn't really big enough a subject for its own video, but it's directly related to using collision objects. That being how to, at runtime, make collision shapes out of polygons and meshes. Thankfully with 2D polygons, this is extremely easy. Just use a collision polygon 2D instead of a regular collision shape 2D and retrieve the polygon data from the polygon in question. And make the collision polygon's own polygon data be the same as the data retrieved, like I have on screen. Now with 3D meshes, this of course gets a bit more complicated and we have a few ways of going about it. The first and most straightforward of which is the collision shape 3D's own make convex from brothers function which automatically generates and applies a single convex shape based on the mesh that's furthest down on the list at the same level of the parent sibling hierarchy. After that, the next set of options are the mesh instance 3D's create trimesh collision, create multiple convex collisions, and create convex collision functions, all of whom create a static body with a child collision shape node, or nodes in the second case, with a shape that is based on the mesh's geometry. The first making a one-to-one -one recreation of the mesh as a shape, the second creating multiple convex shapes calculated through convex decomposition, and the third creating just one convex version of the mesh with additional options controlled by its two bool arguments. Argument 1 cleaning the copy by removing all duplicate and internal vertices, and argument 2 procedurally reducing the duplicate's geometry even further, which of course helps with performance, but makes the shape even less accurate to the mesh than turning it convex already would. If you need to create individual shape objects based on meshes, but don't want the static bodies to come along with it, you can instead retrieve the mesh data within the mesh instance 3D and either call its create trimesh shape function or create convex shape function whom both simply return a shape object based on the mesh's geometry in the same way as the similarly named ones we just covered. Alright, there we go. Finally finished. Truth be told, I ended up basically completely rewriting this script a few times, so I hope it still came out coherent enough for you to learn something. And, as always, if you have any feedback of any kind, please leave it down in the comments. Anyway, until next time, thanks for watching.